Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of The Vanishing Hour. Just a few minor updates, we are now on Podvine, thanks to a request placed by a listener. I'm still learning the ropes of it, but if you'd like to interact with episodes, leave comments, ideas, case suggestions, etc., please feel free to do so on Podvine as well as any of the social media platforms we are on, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube sip of my extremely hot coffee. But with that being said, let's get started on this case. This case is a fairly recent one coming out of Texas. What appeared to have all the makings of an open and shut no-brainer case is now going on its fourth year of being unsolved. The case is not cold by any means, but I think it's safe to say that everyone is still surprised that it's unsolved. This case has been plaguing me for weeks. The more I've researched, the more questions I've had. It's kept me up at night some nights. I went down some strange avenues, but I do want to bring them all in here and talk about them and ultimately theorize as to what I think happened. While there is a lot of coverage on this case in recent months regarding the basics of it and many opinions people may have, I haven't found much concrete information coming from the investigators themselves as of late. While I, while I am going to cover the more popular theories and discussions about it, I want to remain as close to the facts as possible because a lot of the analyzations of this case, in my opinion, have seemed to have gone off the rails a bit, and I don't want to add to that. I do want to warn any listeners that while this is a true crime podcast that covers murders and gruesome shit regularly, This episode, we'll be going into some extreme detail regarding the death of someone. Anyone who Googles the victim's name will also be bombarded with real surveillance footage of the murder happening. It's extremely upsetting and hard to watch, and it's especially hard to listen to. I just want to throw this warning out there because, again, we will be covering in detail the footage in this episode. If this isn't something you want to hear, I do suggest maybe skipping the first 20 minutes or so of this episode, or altogether if you'd rather not risk it. That being said, let's get started. This is The Vanishing of Liz Barraza. Elizabeth, known to those close to her as Liz, was a charming and beautiful 29-year-old woman. She was quirky and a self-proclaimed nerd with an absolute heart of gold. After meeting her husband, Sergio, in college, the two married in 2014. Not long after, they moved into their dream home located at 8623 Cedar Walk Drive in the charming middle-class track neighborhood of Tomball, Texas. Tomball is approximately 30 to 40-ish minutes northwest of Houston, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this area. Liz and Sergio both shared a passion for Star Wars and community service. They found a home for both in the worldwide costuming organization called the 501st Legion. This organization consists of avid fans of Star Wars, costuming, role-playing, and other related activities who come together and share in the lore. They are known for donating time and efforts to spreading kindness and love to anyone in need. They hold events, help support charities, donate time to sick children and disabled adults in hospitals, And obviously a lot more. This, of course, is just the tip of the iceberg for what this organization organization does. Sip coffee. Liz and Sergio were members of the Houston Squadron, with Liz actually holding the title for event coordinator for this particular branch at the time of her death. When they were not participating in the 501st activities, both Liz and Sergio held full-time jobs. Sergio worked alongside his father in some sort of extension of construction. Off the top of my head, I can't remember if it was roofing or tiling or something in that vicinity, but he worked with his family, who I believe owned their own business at that time. Liz worked as a data reporter for a company called Rosen. She briefly held a part-time job at a business called Cool Cat Party Warehouse as a side hustle. For those of you unfamiliar with that, it would be the equivalent of a party city, if you've heard of that, or any other specialty holiday store. It really did tie in with the passion for creativity that Liz had, and she enjoyed her time working for that company. On top of being a huge fan of Star Wars, Liz was also a huge Potterhead. 
this I can relate to. Growing up, I was a huge fan of Harry Potter. I had all the books. I saw all the movies. I dragged my mom and sister to go see them when they came out in theaters. I had the posters. And it seems that Liz was kind of the same way. She made an amazing pair of Toms with hand-drawn Marauder map designs on them and was looking to sell them at one point. They look fantastic. If I could, I would have ordered a pair immediately. She was also a very family-oriented person. She was very close with her mother, her father, and her brother and her sister. They were a tight-knit family. Uh, her father and her bonded over Moody Blues music. And it was really sad to hear her father say that Moody Blues is just something he can no longer listen to since her passing. Her family has been so vocal about sharing her with everyone interested in her case. And you can tell that despite her being physically gone, she is still very much alive through the love and memories of her family and close friends. It's always a little hard for me to read about people and learn about them knowing that they're no longer here. It's harder when there's a social media presence as well. It always creates this feeling of getting to know a person while still being aware of the fact you'll never actually have the opportunity to. It can be hard to go through pictures and to read comments or conversations or activities that they were a part of. I do it because I want to better understand a person and I also want to bring something more to the podcast episode about them rather than just their death. But this case was just a little bit harder than it usually is for me. When you can find a commonality between people uh, and you can relate to small things that you learn, it makes you sad and it really kind of makes you fucking angry. But moving on, Liz's family described her as a friendly, easygoing, and approachable, helpful, and accepting person. She wasn't one to pass judgment on anyone. She accepted everyone for who they are. She had no enemies, according to them. Conflict was simply something she didn't surround herself with. Which is what made her death all the more puzzling to everyone. When you hear the facts about her death, they will make you wonder why someone with no enemies seemed to be targeted by one. So now we're up to the timeline of events of her death. I'm going to take you back to the pre-COVID era in time. January 24th, 2019, to be exact. It's weird because I know exactly where I was on this day and what I was doing. I was at Ikea looking for bunk bed for my kids. As I was researching this case, Google Photos just happened to remind me, and I thought it was very weird. I feel weird reflecting on a day and remembering where I was and what I was doing and thinking about and preparing for and all the while not knowing that someone else in the world was living their last day on Earth. It always makes you feel a little guilty somehow. But anyways, January 24th, 2019 was a Thursday. As far as the public knows, the events leading up to Liz's death began here. Obviously, they had to have started much sooner, but this is where we can track it to. Thursday started out like any other day in the Barraza home. Sergio went to work. Liz went to work. They were approaching their five-year wedding anniversary the following week and were anxiously awaiting that upcoming Tuesday when they would be leaving for Florida. That some sources stated was for a Disney World trip, while others said it was for, I think, like the Universal Studios Orlando Harry Potter attraction. Either way, they were obviously taking a trip together to celebrate their fifth wedding anniversary, and they were doing something that they both enjoyed. Their bags were packed, and they were anxiously awaiting that following Tuesday. At some point during that day, the decision to hold a very last-minute garage sale was made. Liz wanted to sell some of the stuff they were no longer needing or wanting as a way to make some last-minute spending cash for this trip. Sergio thought it was a great idea, so that evening the two set out to post some very generic garage sale signs within their neighborhood notifying of the garage sale for the following morning. I'm not positive if they plan to hold it the entire weekend as well. I'd imagine that was the original plan. That night, Liz made the decision that she was going to call out of work the following morning so as to be home to hold the garage sale. Aside from the signs in the neighborhood and maybe mentioning to it 
immediate family, there was no notification of a garage sale. Neither of the Barrazas made a point to post anything regarding the sale on social media websites or to extended family or friends. I want to stress that because it is an important note in this case. Sergio decided he was still going to head to work the following morning. With that being said, the Barrazas settled in for the evening and prepared for the following morning. Sometime between 12 midnight and 2 a.m. Friday morning, though, a home surveillance camera located on the corner of Oconee and Princeton Place spots a dark pickup truck entering into the neighborhood. Just to visually paint a map for you of this neighborhood real quick, the main drag of this part of town is called Coikendall Road. It runs north to south. Princeton Place is the access road you would turn on from Coikendall in order to enter into the general neighborhood. <clears throat> it dead ends at Oconee. You can go right and follow Oconee as it veers left into Cedar Park Drive, or you can turn left and follow it until it dead ends at Sandusky Drive. This particular camera is located at the T intersection of Oconee and Princeton Place. Aside from the time of night, there is nothing particularly of interest about the fact of this truck entering the neighborhood until later on in the morning. I give the two-hour range because there is conflict, in fact, regarding the exact time of when this truck entered the neighborhood. Original accounts all stated that it was sometime around 2 a.m. However, a recent release of the police report states that the owner of the camera says that it was actually around 12 to 12.30 a.m. Hence the time range. Now, the truck is simply seen making the right-hand turn onto Oconee from Princeton Place headed in the direction of the Barraza home. Both headlights are on, other than the fact that it is a dark four-door crew cab truck, there is nothing else noteworthy. Sometime before 6 a.m., Liz wakes up and gets ready for the morning. At 6.08 a.m., she leaves the home and heads three minutes north to a nearby Starbucks for her morning coffee. At 6.16 a.m., the Barraza's Nest doorbell camera captures Liz returning home. She approaches the door with her drink and keys in hand. As she opens the door, she stops to make a silly face at the camera as she enters in. At this time, it is still relatively dark outside. The sun has not risen. But we see no sign of any vehicle passing by that matches the description of the one mentioned earlier. There is no one following her. She is alone at this time. Between 6.17 a.m. and 6.45 a.m., both Liz and Sergio begin to set up for the garage sale. Fold-up tables are brought out into their two-car driveway. They fill the tables with many things. There's a stormtrooper helmet that can be seen placed on the floor beside one of the tables. Um, a Lego man-like head helmet as well. I spotted a mini version of that famous bull statue in New York on one of the tables. There's a giant heavy treadmill that can be seen lining the left side of the driveway. And a cash box was set up on one of the fold-up tables right next to Liz's Starbucks drink. There was obviously many items of value placed out for passerbys to see. At 6.48 a.m., two things happen. First, Sergio departs the residence in what some sources stated was a white utility van. The police report states that he asked Liz to arm the home security system as a safety precaution. Some people felt that was a weird request. Personally, I do not. It's kind of the reason you have one. If she's going to be home alone while hosting a garage sale, it's a smart thing to do. You don't want to turn your back to help someone and then somebody bum rushes your home and starts stealing all of your stuff. It just makes sense. At the same time, a security camera located on the outside building of a music school that sits right at the main entrance of the neighborhood where Coikendall and Princeton Place intersect, picks up a very familiar black four-door crew cab pickup truck, similar to the one spotted early morning, entering into the parking lot of the school. It idles in the parking lot for roughly 10 seconds before exiting the way it came in. One source stated that the car exited the parking lot going left towards Coikendall intersection and then made a U-turn at that intersection headed directly back into the neighborhood via Princeton Place. 
at 6.51 a.m. The same truck is now spotted on that same exact camera that's located at the T intersection where Oconee and Princeton Place meet. It's making a right-hand turn onto the Oconee Drive that leads into Cedar Walk where Liz is currently setting up her garage sale. I was not able to find any information that stated Sergio's vehicle crossed paths with the truck. The Princeton Place entryway is just one of a couple ways to enter into the general vicinity. Without knowing where Sergio's job is located, there's no way to know how he exited the neighborhood. I did read somewhere that Sergio told police that he was headed in the direction of a Lowe's, where he would meet up with his family to usually start their work day. Google Maps places the only nearby Lowe's south of the family home on Coikendall, roughly 5 to 10 miles south. If that information is correct, the most logical exit of, out of the neighborhood that Sergio would have taken that morning would have placed him going directly past this truck as he exited the neighborhood. Three minutes after Sergio departed the residence at 6.48 a.m., the Barraza doorbell camera spots the black truck drive past the home on Cedar Park Drive. It heads from the right of the screen to the left before disappearing out of line of sight. Liz at this time is also out of view of the camera on the left side of the screen, which is where their driveway would be. The layout of their home has the walkway to the door sharing a wall with the home, which creates a hallway-like tunnel to the door. That wall blocks the view of the camera seeing the driveway or Liz at this point. But you can hear the faint sound of her Bluetooth speaker or her phone playing some sort of media, which is keeping her company while she sets up for the garage sale. It's important to point out that a neighbor's house across the street and a few houses to the left of theirs has a surveillance camera that just barely captures the front of the Barraza home, the driveway, and the street in front of it. It is at a fair distance away and maybe 480 quality, but it is enough to make out Liz, the tables, and the surrounding area. This camera also captures the black truck pa driving past the Barraza residence. It maybe goes as far as one house length away before performing a three-point U-turn and stopping in what looks like the middle of the street, but it's possible it was off to the right-hand side of the street where Liz was actually on. Headlights are on and you can see the beams of light peeking through trees that obscure the direct line of sight of the truck. You see a figure exit the driver's side of the truck and pass in front of it. The headlights flicker as the person's body passes in front of them. They seem to be walking at a slightly faster than normal walking speed. They are swift and fairly light on their feet. They step onto the curb and approach the table that Liz is standing behind. The person is dressed in a lighter colored, maybe white or light beige or other light toned dress is the best blanket term to describe it. It's about knee length. It is not form fitting whatsoever. It has ample fabric and swishes as the person walks. Many describe it as a robe. I don't get robe from it, but that's not necessarily to say it isn't a robe. It reminds me more of like a, a loose mid-length trench coat of some sort or like a smock. If any of you read Madeline as a kid, you know that like blue little dress thing she wore? It reminded me kind of of that, the way it comes out and is flowy. It does hint at a more feminine design, but that doesn't mean that it is. Epson also appears to be wearing some sort of knee-high boots or socks or some sort of stockings. They're also light in color. They approach Liz, and as they get to the table, they appear to have their left hand in either a front side pocket of their dress, or it's tucked close to their body before either touching the table or handing something to Liz. Liz takes one sharp step back and then maybe 15 seconds tops later, the person's right arm extends and a flash is seen. You see Liz crumple forward at the waist as another two flashes occur. She falls back onto the ground onto her back. The person then takes a couple steps forward, arm still extended now, and standing immediately over Liz, and you see them look down. 
At this time, you can make out what appears to be either shoulder length dark hair or maybe possibly a headscarf or something similar that would drape down the way hair would if you extend your neck and look down at something. To me, it looks like hair. One more flash is seen before the person immediately turns around and dashes across the driveway towards their vehicle, the hair blowing in the wind behind them. They enter the driver's seat once more and they drive away. From the time the truck enters the neighborhood on Princeton Place and drives past the home to the time it departs after the shooting, a mere two minutes have passed. The video of the shooting did not capture the audio, however, the Nest doorbell camera of the Barraza home did. I'm going to go close my window real quick because they're trimming the concrete, apparently. Hang on. Now, the audio that can be heard is the background noise of media coming from either Liz's phone or Bluetooth speaker that she has playing while setting up for the garage sale. It appears to be turned down around the same time the person begins to approach the driveway. You can hear Liz mumble what appears to be a good morning. Her tone is recognizable because it is higher pitched and lighter. A lower tone then begins mumbling, and it appears to be some sort of brief exchange of conversation. There doesn't appear to be any like raising in voice or yelling. It sounds like it's normal volume conversation between two people. You continue to hear the two tones talking before you hear the bellowing of the first shot, a blood-curdling scream that is cut off by the sound of the simultaneous second and third bellowing shots, a brief pause in the final bellow of the fourth shot before you hear the sound of fleeing footsteps and the roaring engine of the truck as it departs in the direction it came. At 6.54 a.m., several neighbors report hearing or awakening to the sound of gunshots. When I say bellowed, I, I mean bellowed. The shots were loud. It was clear that there were no attempts at muffling the sound whatsoever via a silencer or any other means. One neighbor immediately looked out their window and they saw the fleeing truck. They then placed a call to 911 at this time. Here's where things get weirder somehow. While the neighbor is on the phone with 911, they report that the truck they just saw fleeing from the scene has now returned and is passing directly in front of the scene on Cedar Park, heading towards Sandusky. So remember, we have the vertical main drag of Koikendall that intersects with Princeton Place, where we spotted the suspect's vehicle entering the neighborhood at several points in time prior to the shooting. Princeton Place dead ends at Oconee, where you can either go left or right. Right will take you up and left onto Cedar Park, which is the route the truck took the morning of the shooting. If you continue on Cedar Park, it will intersect with two streets before dead-ending at a cul-de-sac. The first street is Smoke Lake, which you can only make a ride on, and that will eventually take you to other streets that lead out of the neighborhood. The other street is Sandusky Drive, which you can only turn left on. Sandusky only heads south. It intersects with Oconee, which is where Oconee dead ends up. Sandusky continues south as it tapers diagonally into the neighborhood towards a dead end cul-de-sac as well, maybe a mile south of the Barraza home. It doesn't ever quite reach Koikendal, but it does come within maybe a couple hundred yards of it. The cul-de-sac ends at an empty field that almost looks like an old riverbed that has since become grassy and grown over. Uh, and it can easily be accessed by driving onto the curb and into the grassy area. That grassy stretch of land, again, is maybe a couple hundred yards away from the main drag of Koikendall Road, all of which, again, is south of the home. I'm describing all of this to you because it is vitally important to understand the layout of the neighborhood, why it raises questions about the suspect. If my description confused anyone, hopefully picturing the shape of Nevada will help. The top of Nevada is Cedar Creek, Cedar Walk Drive. The diagonal side of Nevada would be Sandusky, and the right side would be Koikendall. The only exceptions would be that Cedar Walk and Sandusky never intersect with Koikendall, so you would leave those open-ended. That's the basic shape of the neighborhood. 
So if the vehicle left the scene heading towards Koikendal and at some point turned around and returned to the scene, passing straight in front of it, it either took a right on Smoke Lake and exited north out of the neighborhood, or it took a left on Sandusky and headed south in an attempt to maybe take a Coney back to the entrance. Those are really the only two options that this truck could have taken to exit the area. Now one has to ask why the suspect returned in the first place. They successfully fled the scene and headed back the way they came, so why did they decide to turn around and head right back to where they came from? They never stopped and got out again, and obviously they were spotted returning by the neighbor who was currently on the phone with 911. The car proceeded past the house for unknown reasons. Some speculate that it was to make sure she was dead. That might be the only somewhat logical explanation, but I don't think that was the reason. They shot at her three times, hitting her twice and missing once, before standing over her and directly shooting her in the head. A headshot was their way of making sure she was dead. A quick glance as you drive past after isn't going to provide any further verification than that. That's simply my opinion, though. Plus, you do run a huge risk by immediately returning to the scene after the shooting. But if it wasn't for the reason of verification, then what reason is left? That's a very good question that I have yet to come up with an answer for, and it's part of the reason why this case has been bugging me so much. But we will discuss that further in a bit. Now, I said that given the direction the car took after repassing by the house, left them with two options of exiting the neighborhood. We can rule out one based on further home surveillance footage found shortly after the shooting. The suspect did not take the right onto Smoke Lake and exit north out of the neighborhood. They, in fact, made the left on Sandusky and headed south down the street. They passed its intersection with Oconee, which would have been one of the three remaining ways to leave the area. The next option would have been London Way, Making a left would be the only option onto London Way, and this would lead directly out to Coikendall. The last option would have been Brogan Court, a small side street that the driver would have only been able to make a left on, and that would have led them to Hagshire, and then back up to London Way and out to Coikendall. A camera south of all of these intersections allegedly caught the vehicle continuing south on Sandusky towards the dead end cul-de-sac at 6.58 a.m., four minutes after fleeing the scene. It allegedly never re-emerged on camera to exit the neighborhood from any of the avenues I just mentioned. Knowing this, that begs the question of where in the fuck did this truck go? At this point, there seems to be only three logical options as to where it went, at least that I can think of. Option one, the vehicle proceeded to pull into any one of the various enclosed garages south of that last camera and remained there until a later time where it exited the neighborhood and just simply wasn't caught by any surveillance footage that was collected. That option would insinuate that the killer had a connection to the neighborhood in some form, whether they lived there, had friends or family that they visited, or something of that nature. While a plausible option, it does make you wonder why the truck was never recovered if the police performed a proper canvas or investigation into the area. Also, I'm pretty sure that any neighbors would have reported knowing someone owning or connected to that truck matching the description because of how highly publicized this case was after the shooting. That leads to option two. Option two is that the truck simply was missed by surveillance camera footage after passing by that last one. This is plausible because while we can view the footage of the truck on the camera from Sandusky four minutes after the shooting, we have no footage confirming it ever passed by again that was publicly released. I don't know if the police fine-toothed the footage or how far after the incident they checked for the truck or if they even did or could. The only assurance provided that stated the truck never repassed by the camera was from the owner themselves in a text they sent another YouTuber who was gathering information about the case. I will provide links to this and other sources mentioned in the description of this video on YouTube if you're interested in hearing their findings. They did a great job at providing information and sharing their own thoughts and feelings on the case. 
even if I don't necessarily agree with all of them. Option three is the only other option that may be plausible. Option three suggests that the truck proceeded down Sandusky all the way down to its dead-end cul-de-sac, where it then proceeded onto the curb and into the deserted grassy riverbed stretch of land that connected to Koikendal, maybe a couple hundred yards away. There were no gates or obstructions of any kind. There were no cement blocks or anything that would deter a vehicle from passing through. To be fair, even if there were, this was a fairly hefty truck that would have been able to maneuver basic obstructions. You honestly probably could do the drive in a golf cart and you would be fine. It is not rough by any means based on the photos that I've seen. If this option is the case, though, the question needs to be begged as to why. Back at the scene, officers arrive, they secure the immediate area and enter the home. The alarm is set off, notifying Sergio and Liz's parents that they are there and something has happened. Sergio returns to the scene and is immediately questioned. Paramedics arrive and begin to perform life-saving measures on Liz. Life lift is ultimately called to airlift her to the nearest hospital. Sergio is asked to remain on scene to answer some questions. Based on all original accounts, he was asked what happened that morning when he left, anything unusual seen or heard. He's asked questions about Liz and if she or they had any known enemies. It was stated at that time that nothing was reported. The pu public has operated under that assumption since until fairly recently, however. As I previously mentioned, the police report became public in recent months and it is revealed by one officer's account that Sergio mentioned during questioning at the scene that there was one person who Liz was in fact having issues with. I will not reveal this person's name despite it being public information. You're welcome to head to any of the sources listed in the description of this podcast on YouTube to view the report yourself. I will say that the person is a female who was known to be a member of the 501st Legion that both Liz and Sergio, Sergio were members of. The information regarding the tension between Liz and this person is minimal at this time, but according to these sources, it has been privately validated to them by either current or former members of the Legion who were familiar with the situation at that time. As of right now, I will still be referring to this information as alleged because I myself have not been able to confirm any of it. But the alleged issues stemmed from Liz failing to notify this particular person and potentially others in the Legion of planned events for the organization that Liz was spearheading. These allegations were allegedly based on this person believing that Liz intentionally left them out of the notifications of events due to not liking them for unknown reasons. Again, all of this is alleged, and I have yet to find any corroborating evidence to support it. However, this name was given to the police as a person of interest by Sergio. Sergio has never mentioned this name since, nor has anyone else even remotely related to the case. I don't know if that means this person was immediately cleared of suspicion, or if this was purposely undisclosed. It was on the report, and the report was allowed, and did in fact have information redacted as a way to protect the integrity of its investigation. The fact that this name was not part of those redactions is curious. After his questioning, though, Sergio was taken to the hospital to be with his wife, who was on life support at this point and not expected to survive. <clears throat> I will note that out of the multiple officers' accounts of the events when they arrived on scene, one officer felt they had to mention that at no point during this conversation with Sergio did he ask how his wife was or if he could go be with her. I mention this for the people who will go out looking for the report and find that suspicious. Yes, this could be viewed as suspicious. If this was the only officer to report having talked to Sergio, though, there were several officers on the scene, half of which more than likely spoke to Sergio. None of them commented on his behavior. Sergio stated he asked numerous times about his wife and wasn't given any info at that time. This one officer's account doesn't necessarily mean he didn't ask to leave or how she was doing, so bear that in mind, please. 
Sadly, Liz did not survive the injuries she sus- she sustained that fateful morning. The decision was made to remove her from life support. Being a donor, Liz's passing was able to save several lives and restore the vision of another person. Family and friends were devastated by their loss. A vigil was held for Liz where all members brought and lit their lightsabers in remembrance of her. I thought that was a beautifully unique way to honor her. Meanwhile, investigators worked tirelessly to try and figure out what had happened that morning and why. Another head-scratching piece of information revealed from the police report was the mention of a vehicle matching the suspect's car that was picked up on Coikendall Road five minutes after the shooting. When the 911 call came in with the description of the suspect's vehicle, which I might add, the surveillance video was not extremely descriptive, but the neighbor's watchful eye was. The neighbor who physically saw the vehicle flee the scene gave the description of a 2013 to 2018 Nissan Frontier Pro 4X crew cab truck in black in color. The video obviously corroborated these facts. The Pro 4X logo can be seen on the side of the truck bed. Some people speculated that the truck could have also been a Nissan Titan Pro X. However, it was indicated that the truck was missing the Titan emblem on the side doors, leading investigators to conclude that the truck was in fact the Frontier series. Now, this model of truck is not as common as you would think. It isn't your run-of-the-mill Chevy or Ford that there seems to be more than enough of in this area. This particular model of truck is considered uncommon to this area. The police report that was released also had with it released a DMV report of registered vehicles of this model within Tomball, Texas with it. And I think the report only had maybe 40 vehicles tops for the entire city. So not very common. You would think that this would have upped the chances of locating the vehicle, and it appears that originally, to some extent, it did. Roughly five minutes after the 911 call was placed and the BOLO, or be on the lookout, was issued to all patrol cars in the area, a vehicle matching this description was located on Coikendall headed south. The police report logs the patrol officer's radio calls while spotting this vehicle and following behind it. He tails the car south and follows it as it makes a right turn onto Farm to Market Highway 2920. This also happens to be the same main intersection that the Lowe's that was previously mentioned is located on. The officer reports continuing to follow the suspected vehicle for maybe a quarter of a mile before stating he's signaling for a pullover in front of a local ER located just shy of Jester Boulevard. The report states that the vehicle was stopped and its VIN number was taken and ran. The eerie thing about this stop is that there is no more mention made after this point. Again, I don't know if this was redacted for the sake of the investigation or if there was some other reason it was left out. But if you think about it, what are the odds of in the area of this country where the majority of black trucks on the road are either Ford or Chevy, you spot the uncommon Frontier Pro X same color and relative year minutes from the scene and at 7 a.m. in the morning. It's a little wild when you think of the odds. Now, I'd like to think that if they actually found anything incriminating during this stop, this case would have already been solved or at least pretty dang close to it. However, there has been no mention of anything. There's been no suspects cleared, no lists of people of interest being worked, nothing other than the generalization of leads coming in, but not leading to nothing. Nothing else seems to have been stated. Something tells me that police may have a suspect in mind, but just no evidence to prove that they in fact committed the crime. As the case stands currently, it is active, but with no new information. One year after the murder, investigators revealed that they were waiting for a search warrant to be issued and that when it was, they had high hopes of it blowing the case wide open. After that, though, it went dead silent. There was no mention made regarding the outcome of the warrant or anything related. I think it's safe to say that whatever was discovered during the warrant, if anything, was not enough. This is partially why I believe they still have a suspect, but no way to charge them at this time. 
There was also a brief mention of a person of interest in Florida back in January of this year. The very brief article simply stated that. There was no further clarification, no update on how that panned out or how they came to this conclusion of a person of interest. This isn't uncommon, though. As I've stated many times, police never show their complete hand in an investigation. It wouldn't be wise to. But that is where we are at. What I would like to go over now, though, are issues that I have. First issue I have is where's the motive? Robbery is usually a fairly common one, but unlikely in this scenario because nothing was taken. As I mentioned, there were valuable items out there. There was also a cash box with $100 in it that was untouched. On top of all of that, we saw the footage and we saw that the person literally walked up, shot her four times, and ran away. Nothing was touched by this person. The next motive you'd have to consider would be random act of violence. I also don't think that random is likely. If the truck spotted on the cameras prior to the shooting was the suspect and it was circling the neighborhood and waited until she was alone, a random attacker would have not done that. They would have driven up and just shot whoever was out there. If the footage from midnight to 2 a.m. window is also the suspect that shows a level of premeditation as well. I'm curious if other surveillance was captured for that period that spotted the truck at that time as well. However, there's never been any mention of that. <clears throat> so the next motive people would consider would be maybe road rage. It's possible, but it's most likely not the case. But again, if premeditation was there with the footage from the night before, it would mean that the road rage incident had happened several hours, if not days prior. That isn't really common with road rage incidents at all. Road rage usually is a heat of the moment attack. And people don't really go home and plot and then stalk their victim over a road rage incident. This just doesn't seem to have the elements of road rage. The next motive would be maybe a disgruntled neighbor. Also relatively unlikely. It doesn't completely support the fact that the truck has never been found. I feel like other witnesses might have recognized the truck if it frequented in the neighborhood or was a neighbor's vehicle. Police would more than likely have found it while doing an investigation into neighbors, either physically or some sort of paper trail of, of the vehicle connecting to a home or a person in the neighborhood. It also doesn't explain the seemingly odd and erratic behavior of the car in the neighborhood after the shooting. Someone familiar with the area would know about the cameras to an extent, and they would possibly be worried about being seen. This is obviously speculative on my behalf, but if I'm planning to shoot someone in public, my goal is probably to avoid being caught as much as possible. Being familiar with the area would have provided less opportunity to be caught on camera. We cannot rule out someone who maybe wasn't familiar enough with the neighborhood yet, though. The camera at the school seems like a huge oversight to me, not to mention that directly across the street from the school, there was also a bank. That kind of leaves us with one motive left, which would be that this was a personally targeted attack. This one makes the most sense to me. Despite her family and friends claiming no enemies, it was revealed that there was an issue with a 501 member at some point. This could be possible. It's possible there were other prior disgruntled members or social media friends or somewhat sort of outside of her normal circle associates that had seemingly slid under the radar up until this point. Her attack was directed at, at her. There was a level of premeditation. This wasn't an expert or a hired hitman either. The first shot was missed, and that was standing directly in front of her within a few feet. A person with experience shooting would not have missed that for a shot. Also, while we are on the topic of a gun, it was revealed that there were no cartridges left at the scene, and since we saw that no one picked them up before fleeing, the only gun that could have probably done this was a revolver. This was also confirmed by investigators. So if the motive is personal, then the question is, who? 
As I mentioned, a disgruntled 501 member makes sense. It was the first person that came to Sergio's mind, despite him and no one else mentioning it since. This organization means a lot to its members, including this particular person. I was able to locate them via social media and even found a podcast that they were a guest on at one point, who came on and discussed their art of costume making and their love for the 501 Legion. Further digging revealed that this person was also a higher ranking person in the 501 Legion and or its sister legions. They held the title of regional captain for a Houston branch related to the organization for three years, ending in November of 2018, just two months before the shooting. To make it very clear, this person didn't appear to be replaced by Liz in any way. As far as I could see, they were two completely different positions and potentially two different branches of the legions. So I feel safe ruling out the replacement revenge angle. A quick search of Liz's friends list on social media revealed that she had this person as a friend on this particular site. However, after locating the person on other social media sites and finding two other accounts that were theirs as well, not only did I find that they were not friends on there, but that there was nothing dating back any later than 2020. This person either, this person also made brief mention of their prior struggle with mental health when posting a birthday donation campaign in support of mental health services. No, that does not mean that everyone who has or has struggled with mental health issues is a cold-hearted murderer. These are all simply things that I noted as I investigated that person. Ultimately, I found nothing incriminating. I searched prior dresses to check proximity. I searched for potential vehicles that matched the description of the suspects that could be tied to this person, and I found nothing. That is the extent of the research that I did into this person at this point in time. The next person to consider would be the Florida person of interest. Now, not much can be said on this person other than that one source that I read stated the police had a person of interest in Florida. I do know that at some point in her life, Liz did live in Florida, and both her and her husband did frequently visit there for the Universal Studios attractions and the Disney World attractions. However, without a name, a photo, a point of reference to start at, there's virtually no way to know who or how this person is tied to the case, or if they even exist. Another angle people considered was maybe a scorned lover. While there's no proof that either Sergio or Liz were having an affair, we do see far too often this being the leading cause for spousal deaths. I'm not saying this is necessarily what I think happened, but you can't completely rule it out either. It does carry some slight logic to it despite its unlikelihood. Of all these potential motives and suspects, I would say the one that carries any sort of weight is the personal member of her social circle, possibly a 501 member that was mentioned, or a potential scorned lover just by default. Those two are the only ones that carry the weight of the crime as we know it, in my opinion. Next, I'd like to cover some of the analyzations out there that I have some problems with. The first one that comes to mind is the accomplice theory. Some people believe that there was an accomplice physically present at the time of the murder. My issue isn't with this idea, but rather the way people have come to this conclusion. Obviously, this case is unique because the crime was caught on camera. The footage has since been released to the public. It is extremely grainy and from a very far distance, but it's clear enough to make out what happens and to hear what happens as well. It's honestly haunting. Now, investigators usually go through the process of enhancing footage within the range of not manipulating to see if there's any way they can clean up audio or visual that can provide further info. So far, there hasn't been much progress, professionally speaking, but that hasn't stopped many web sleuths and couch detectives from trying their hand at it. Problem is that people are so desperate to see something or hear something that they start to draw some seriously reaching conclusions. There's some people who've sworn they see an extra person in the snapshots of the vehicle fleeing the scene. I'm sorry, but there is no way to be able to definitively see anything. Personally, I've gone through hours of staring at the photos and watching the videos, and Austin lighting, etc., and there's nothing indicating there's someone there. That doesn't mean that there isn't, but that 
but there's certainly nothing there to say that there is either. One source said that police stated that more than one person was involved. I cannot confirm that they said that personally because I found nothing stating that from them directly, but let's just say that they did in fact confirm more than one person was involved. That doesn't automatically mean that puts another person in the car that morning. That could mean helping in planning, executing, and it could mean that this or other person or persons were the reason she was targeted to begin with. People also drew the same conclusion based off of audio that was captured from the nest doorbell of the home that was just out of line of sight of the attack. Again, the audio is of minimal quality. You can hear the mumblings of a conversation before the booming shots and the screaming from Liz and the sound of the truck fleeing as it passes in front of the camera. Those are the only definitive sounds you can hear. The rest is mumbling, but again, people swear that they can hear numerous voices, distinct words, and dialogue. Again, none of these people are professionals, and if the pros haven't heard or seen it, I'm sure you're not hearing or seeing it either. A certain level of speculation is required in any investigation because it helps brainstorm ideas and avenues to investigate. I am a big believer in it, don't get me wrong. The whole podcast is built off of possible speculations, really, but I don't swear by any of it. No one should until it is proven without a doubt by factual supporting evidence. Next issue that I had was the attire and or the possibility of a mask being worn. Based off of the same reasons people believe there was a second person at the scene in the truck, some people have suggested that the shooter was wearing a mask. Some have gone so far as to say that they have determined the person was wearing a old man mask, the full-blown rubber head and neck pullover type. Again, they've come to this conclusion based off of extremely grainy millisecond footage. There is no physical way to determine this is in fact true. There were no witnesses stating they saw a person in a mask flee the scene. Investigators have no made no mention of believing this as well. Nothing I've seen of the concrete evidence available indicates that the person is wearing a mask. What can be seen in the footage is baffling, though. The suspect appears to either have extremely long hair or a scarf or other fabric in, gen, in the general area of your head that looks like hair as they flee from the scene. It's long and dark and flowy as they're running away. The suspect is also wearing a very light colored smock or robe or dress of some sort, something relatively longer and flowy as well. It comes to about knee length and they appear to either have knee high light colored socks or knee high boots. Many are convinced that the person's wearing a bathrobe. To me, it reads more like a feminine trench coat or overcoat. It's flowy like a feminine coat and not a man coat. You can see the suspect approach Liz with their hand or arm nestled somewhere close to their body or maybe in the coat. And then you see the motion of them pulling their arm out and Liz takes a step back. My personal opinion of this person based on the video is that it is a female. The stride to the table, the way they carry their weight, it's not stompy or stocky or rough or of more of a masculine nature. It's more of a light on their feet and swift. It reads female to me, but plenty of people disagree. Plenty think it's a man in a disguise. I don't get that from the footage, but you can't rule it out either. Those same people also think that the murky audio from the nest doorbell solidifies it's a man because the mumbling appears to be deeper in tone. First of all, women can have deep toned voices. They could also be disguising their voice, but more obviously, maybe you're misjudging the tone off of a device meant to record video and not necessarily audio from hundreds of yards away. I don't think the audio or the video, for that matter, definitively rule out one more than the other, but if you're asking for my opinion, based on what I can make out with my eyes, I am more inclined to say this person is a female and that they are fast. They bolt into the car extremely fast, in my opinion. That could have been an adrenaline rush, but damn, did they get there quickly. I also am more inclined to believe this person is female based off of a general comparison of their height in accordance to Liz and the table. Now, while they are on a slight decline because they are standing in a driveway, Liz herself is maybe no taller than 5'3", and the person 
when factoring in the decline and ratio to the table doesn't appear to be much taller than her. To me, statistically, it's more likely a woman. Women can have deeper tone voices. Again, the tone sounds deeper, but the audio is relatively fuzzy, and it only really captures mumbling. Solely based off of the video footage of the person walking up, their mannerisms, their stride, their swiftness, their smaller stature, it all points to women, including the way that they shoot the gun. Guys, this is Texas. It's gun country out there. You can't throw a rock without hitting a man who is strapped. Obviously, women are strapped too, don't get me wrong, but the likelihood of a smaller framed male dressed in clothing that appears to be feminine, with longer hair and a head or a headscarf of some sort, with a panicky shot who misses her the first shot and then panic fires at her twice more before standing over her, shooting her in the head and running away like a fucking gazelle, would be a rare find. This person was not built or bulky or meaty or large in stature. And again, as I mentioned, a general comparison in their size ratio to the table to other things nearby and Liz, this person doesn't look like they're towering over a five foot three Liz. I have watched the horrendous footage upwards of a hundred times at this point, and my confident opinion is that they are looking for a woman in regards to who shot Liz. So let's discuss the most logical suspects in this case from an outsider's perspective. We've kind of already gone over some of them, but we're going to list more of the whys and why nots somebody might be considered a suspect. The first person that comes to everybody's mind is obviously the husband, Sergio. Not necessarily as the shooter per se, but maybe more of the motivation behind the shooting. Some reasons why are, for starters, the timing is suspicious. When Sergio arrived back on the scene and was questioned by police, he was able to immediately give them the exact time he left the house. Is that incriminating on its own? Obviously not. But I'd say it's less common for people to pull the exact time out of their head of something as mundane as leaving for work that morning down to the very minute. Usually people will be like, yeah, I left around 6.50-ish or, you know, seven just before 7 a.m. No, he pulled 6.48 out of his head. Obviously, this is not uncommon. It's just a little odd. He happens to leave four minutes before his wife is shot. Some sources within the police document that were actually listed as neighbors to the couple stated that he usually wouldn't leave any time before 7 a.m., Sergio has since stated that his neighbor, who was listed as a source on the document, is wrong by stating that, and that it was actually Liz who left at that time, not him. He would always leave at roughly the same time he did that morning. It's a matter of minutes, so it really doesn't carry that much weight, in my opinion, either way, but Sergio allegedly departed the residence in a white utility van, while Liz would depart in a dark sedan. I'm pretty sure the neighbor would have been able to tell who was leaving the home based solely on that. I'm just saying. Overall, I found it odd that he left exactly four minutes prior to the shooting and was able to recall the exact time he left when he arrived back at a chaotic scene, knowing his wife had been attacked in their driveway and not really knowing the extent of the situation. I usually don't remember a precise time unless I need to, but again, that is just me and everyone is different. The next thing that raised eyebrows was the mention of the lack of initial concern. The police report obtained stated that one officer that initially questioned Sergio noted that at no point did Sergio ask how his wife was or if he could go see her. Out of context, yes, that is incriminating, but there's a lot going on in this situation. Your mind is in a million different places, so it is understandable. But just to play devil's advocate here, would someone ask if they already knew the answer? Despite your mind being in a million places, wouldn't a reasonable person's mind immediately be on their loved one? Again, this isn't evidence, this is pure speculation and considering all angles here. The next suspicious activity was that he remarried rather quickly. Liz dies in January of 2019. From what I could find, his first public post with a new girlfriend on social media was June of 2020. They are confirmed married minimally by October of 2021. Now, this doesn't mean that every widower who's married after the murder of their spouse is a cold-hearted piece of shit. People are allowed to move on. 
We all mourn differently and none of us can speak to what he went through but him. From an outsider's perspective, some people felt that they had to wonder at a hasty marriage so soon after the death of his wife. Sergio has stated that he did not start dating his new wife until 18 months after Liz's passing. Prior to this, he did not know this woman, nor was he interested in dating or remarrying at that time. Things sort of just happened that way, according to him. I wasn't able to find anything with any with my limited capab capabilities. Man, am I stumbling today. That proved that he was lying about this fact, or that Liz maybe knew this woman, or that this woman knew either of them prior to her death. A very minute detail I wanted to throw out there as I was researching this was that I stumbled across a YouTube comment on one of the source videos of someone claiming to be a cousin of Liz's and stating that while they didn't initially suspect Sergio, they do now. They didn't give any reasons. They didn't give any verification of who they were. This was just an observation as I scrolled through comments on an informational video. There was nothing more substantiating this statement, and Liz's family has never publicly come out and stated that they felt Sergio had something to do with this. The other thing would be the person of interest that was mentioned by Sergio. The police report that was recently made public was revealed that the day of the shooting, Sergio revealed to officers on scene that there was one person Liz had issues with that was related to the 501st club that they were a part of person's name, which again, I will not reveal, but it is included in the report, has never been public publicly mentioned by investigators, families, or friends, or even Sergio since this day. The only time this name has shown up is when Sergio stated it that day, according to this report. He has since stated that Liz never had issues with anyone. So the backpedaling is a little weird. Maybe he was instructed to do so, but if the report is public and that information wasn't redacted, it would indicate that he was never told not to mention this person, which makes it a little odd. Now, some of the reasons why I feel he is not a suspect. Sergio has remained an active face in the push for justice for Liz, especially within the first year or two after her death. He continued to maintain contact with her family, he worked on memorials for her, and he seems to have a solid relationship with her family despite moving on with his life. His new wife is actively posting and reposting any information regarding Liz's death. I've personally seen the public posts on her social media accounts, and they do seem genuine. The police haven't named him a suspect or even a person of interest in this case. Ultimately, while I think this murder was a personally charged murder, and that can often be seen in spousal situations, and given the oddness of some of the facts surrounding Sergio, it is plausible. However, I don't know if I consider him a real suspect in his wife's murder. My gut takes me a different direction. However, that doesn't rule out her death being motivated by Sergio without him actually realizing that. The next, uh, next suspect, oh good god, on the list would be the new wife. Now, obviously, it's a logical suspicion to have when a husband remarries so quickly after the murder of his wife. Many have to wonder if they were already in a relationship. The uncertainty of the suspect being a male or female also does not eliminate her based on gender. Her listed addresses were all south of the crime scene, with one in particular coming up as a shared address to the couple post lives. But the route from the crime scene to the address follows the exact path that the suspect vehicle did the morning of the murder and the bolo and the traffic stop performed because of it. Reasons why I do not feel that she is a suspect is that there's no physical evidence suggesting she even knew Sergio or Liz prior to Liz's death, and it's not enough to marry a widower to consider somebody guilty of murder. I've failed to find any concrete connection, whether it be through cosplay, work, social circles, social media, etc. The only thing that ties her to this family before Liz's death is her close proximity to where they lived. And address history never put her more than 30 minutes away from them, but that is not enough to consider somebody a reasonable suspect. This, the next suspect, the coffee's kicking in, <laughs> the next suspect on the list would be an angry associate. Obviously, if it isn't one of the above-dimensioned suspects, it would make sense that the next person is someone who is relatively close to Liz. This attack carries several notations of being a personally motivated attack. 
Maybe she didn't know the shooter specifically, but that doesn't rule them out of having a common person between them. Maybe the shooter was hired or asked to 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 do this for someone. Good lord. While her friends and family and investigators didn't originally and still maintain that Liz had no conflict with anyone, that doesn't mean that there wasn't any. As I've mentioned already, with the release of the police report to the public, that has revealed an otherwise opinion. I read through the report myself weeks ago. The report again revealed that Sergio named somebody that Liz was having issues with. As I've already mentioned, he allegedly brought their name up this one time and never since. Nor has anyone else mentioned this person. Again, the person is someone from the 501st Legion who would place them in a general circle of socialness with Liz. I did confirm that they were friends on one social media website. No word on if the person has been cleared or is still considered a person of interest. My opinion is that they are the person who was part of the search warrant towards the beginning of the investigation. That's solely my opinion, though. I am not limiting the possibility to just this person, though. Something is nagging at me that there was more going on in the way of issues with people that hasn't been made public at this time. The mention of the Florida person of interest is also a possibility, despite so little information regarding it. Reasons why this person wouldn't be a suspect would be, regarding the Florida person of interest, we do know that while at some point in Liz's life prior to her death, she did actually live in Florida, for some sort of period of time. She also visited frequently with her husband and was planning a trip the following week before her death. But aside from that, there is seemingly nothing more tying this person of interest to them. There was no mention of how this person is tied to the case or who they were. Depending on how long she lived in Florida, this person could be a childhood friend or someone who had information regarding conflict that she was having. Keep in mind that a person of interest doesn't mean suspect person of interest means that they are of interest to the case because there is enough reason to believe that they may have information that can help solve the case. Depending on that information, a person can be ruled out altogether or upgraded to a suspect. There's been talk that the truck has never been found because it could have possibly been a rental, and this would line up with this this theory. It could also line up with someone being from out of state could also explain the odd driving in the neighborhood that seemed to be done by someone unfamiliar with the area that is just based off the actions taken after the shooting. Obviously, with most of her family and friends claiming to not know any issues Liz may have been having with anyone, that does cast a slight doubt on this avenue, but it's not impossible. While she was close to friends and family, that doesn't mean she would automatically share this information. Sometimes we keep things to ourselves for whatever reason. Also, it's possible she was unaware of a problem someone had with her. This seems the most likely to me, and with the recent finding that Sergio had mentioned someone, that changes this avenue completely and makes it, in fact, more plausible. So, to consider all the information we've gone over, I have done my best to form a theory that seems the most logical with minimal speculation. Here it is. I believe that Liz was targeted by someone who had taken personal issue with her, this may have been an issue she was well aware of that she didn't feel was a potential danger to her, or it could have been an issue she was completely unaware of. Regardless, this person had a vendetta against her. In a perfect world, I would scour her social media accounts, her phone records, text records, and any potential issues that were brought up to her in both her professional and extracurricular activities she was a part of. That includes the 501st Legion. Many accounts stated that there was nothing found, but with the contradicting information coming from the police report, I would say it's worth looking into again. The shooter, I believe, is a woman. Whether there was someone in the car with her that day or not is unclear at this time. There is no valid analyzation of footage or audio that convinces me there was. As far as a disguise goes, it's definitely possible that one was used, but to say that you see that in the footage available is far-fetched. I won't rule it out as a possibility at this time, though. Either way, it does, doesn't change anything. I do think there is a strong possibility that more than one person had a hand in this murder. I would say at least one other person knew that this attack was going to happen and at minimum did nothing to stop it, and that is at a minimum. Given the facts of the case, the shooter used a revolver since there were no cartridges left at the scene. Police have seemingly confirmed this. 
Judging by the evidence of the video, it was the far more common double action revolver and not a single action. I came to this conclusion based off of the footage and never witnessing the suspect having to manually pull the hammer in between shots. Double action is usually referred to as self-cocking as well. Double action revolvers come in various chamber sizes, including 5, 6, 7, 8, and 10 shot double action. All of these would correspond to the amount of shots fired, with it being at 4. They are also notoriously known for being loud and somewhat incompatible with silencer attachments, although there does seem to be a few newer models that experiment with silencer attachment styles. The double action is also known to have a stronger kickback than the single action, making it a much harder gun to maneuver precision-wise for people who are not used to firing the weapon. I attempted to locate the autopsy report in hopes of finding the type of bullet used so that we could narrow down the gun further. However, I wasn't able to locate that. Knowing this, though, and watching the footage, it is clear that the first shot was at very close distance. All of them were, and at no more than a couple feet max, and the first shot completely missed Liz and hit the house behind her. This caused the frantic second and third shots immediately after, one which hit her in the side of the head, the other hitting her in the chest. The final shot was delivered directly at her head as she laid on the ground. Missing the first shot and panic firing after at such a close range indicates someone unfamiliar with that particular gun. This suggests someone who had access to a gun rather than owning them, in my opinion, or some sort of gun enthusiast. They either bought it directly before the murder and had little to no practice using it, or they had access to guns and they took advantage of that that morning. Most likely not their own guns. I'm personally leaning more towards the borrowing or maybe stealing idea. While this murder wasn't executed in a professional manner, there still seems to be steps taken in an attempt to elude police. I think purchasing a gun would go against that instinct. I believe someone out there knows their gun was borrowed or stolen around this time of the shooting. The same goes for the car. Using your own car to commit a murder in broad daylight is a very risky move. This was an upscale neighborhood where home cameras were visibly seen from the street, not to mention businesses that were located at the entrance of the neighborhood, one which, again, was a bank and the other was a school. There was no evidence mentioned that was collected from the bank. However, put yourself in the mindset of this killer for a moment. You're mad at this person. You're mad enough that you would want them dead. You begin to plot how you'll murder them. You don't want to get caught, obviously, because you haven't turned yourself in at this point. You decide upon shooting them in front of their home at 7 a.m. on a Friday morning. But why? If we are operating under the assumption that this person had to have known Liz on some varying personal level, how well would they need to know her to know her normal schedule for a Friday and that she would be deviating from it that morning? That has been and will continue to be the crux of this case. If what her family said is true, that no one outside of a few people knew that she had called out of work that morning, that she was going to be in her driveway setting up for a garage sale, take a long, hard look at the list of those people. I'm not saying that any of these people automatically did it, but these people maybe need to reassess who they spoke to from the time that Liz told them she would be staying home to have a garage sale and not going to work, and to when she was murdered. My gut tells me that more than a few people knew. It's possible that someone is slipping their minds or that they aren't aware that other people knew. While it is last minute, I wouldn't find it impossible to argue that maybe Liz last minute let some friends know about it in hopes that they would come out and support. It's completely possible that she did this and no one knew she did either. With a timeline this tight, you have to widen the net of possibilities that you originally ruled out. The likelihood that this person just got lucky that morning is relatively low. Now, that isn't to say that maybe this person's original plan was to ambush her on her way to her car that morning. They had an ample driveway and a two-car garage. While on this day her car was parked on the street, I don't know if that was her usual habit to do so. If their garage was where they stored their cars, it would make it harder to ambush someone on their way to their car in the morning. If she usually parked it in the driveway, that could be what the original plan was. It's clear that this shooter waited for Liz to be alone. They went out of their way to make sure Sergio would not be there. 
I think this because A, it's harder to kill two people rather than one, especially if you're a shit shot like this idiot was. And B, it's possible that they didn't want to risk Sergio recognizing him if they were unable to make sure he would be dead as well. Their focus was obviously her. They needed her dead when they left that scene. Nothing else mattered. To have Sergio out there as well would lessen the chances of successfully doing that and getting away in enough time without substantial risk. My thoughts are that the family who knew about the changed plans needs to re-examine who knew about them, who could have potentially known as well. I think an answer lies there. I'm sure they have already done this too. I know I'd be questioning everything if I were in their shoes. One source suggested that the person arrived at the house before Liz left for coffee that morning, followed her and realized she wasn't headed to work and instead headed to Starbucks and then home. And then they decided that their plan was to wait for Sergio to leave and to ambush her then. That would explain the luck aspect of the situation, if there is one, in arriving on a day where everything deviated from the norm. It's completely possible that the original plan was to stalk her. She left that morning, follow her on her trip to work, and somewhere between exiting her home that morning and getting to work, they planned on ambushing her, whether it was a drive-by shooting, while she was stopped at a light, whatever, and then they would just take off. But when the realization hit that she wasn't leaving that morning, they had to amend their plan, hence the odd driving patterns before the shooting with pulling into the music school. Maybe waiting to see her car pass, realizing it didn't, exiting out, U-turning, maybe then spotting Sergio's van, and then heading straight to the scene, seeing her outside, performing the three-point turn, and just shooting her. It explains the shitty shooting, all panicked, and then leaving immediately. It also could explain the confusing return to the scene. When you plan something devious as shooting someone and taking their life, I'm sure there's a plan you form and you do your best to stick to it. Without it, you lose confidence and start to doubt whether you do it. This person no doubt had a plan, but I think the plan began to crumble when they expect the expected hate behaviors of Liz were not met that morning, and this led to their improvisation. I think the whole approaching her in her driveway the way they did was improvised. I think after the shooting, the person was so flustered and adrenalized that they made the odd judgment calls that they did. A sense of hesitation possibly with the returning to the scene almost as a knee-jerk reaction like did I really just do that that's kind of how the drive-by after the shooting felt to me it was sort of like a reality setting in holy shit I need to get the fuck out of here that would then lead to the further deviation they never performed another u-turn to exit the way they came which was the only route they seemingly knew and I think that this was why they decided to drive down Sandusky, but that wasn't part of the original plan. I think because they weren't familiar with the streets to take and to get out of the neighborhood, they continued down Sandusky and potentially cut through the cul-de-sac to get onto Koikendall. I think at that point, that is when the police may have spotted them via the bolo. Ultimately, if I had to take a guess, this person is currently in a neutral area of the case. I think that they are just close enough to Liz's circle to be linked to her, but fall just short of a range of suspicion by her friends and family. I think this person has remained fairly quiet about the case since it happened. Some suspects that are part of social cir circles of the victims like to throw themselves immediately into the middle of it all, acting as an advocate of justice, but using that as a guise to know where the case is and to manage their concern that way. This person, in my opinion, most likely will not be doing that. I think this person was immediately spooked by what they did and have since distanced themselves from anything related to it. I don't think they attended vigils or posted updates or pushes for justice or any part of that. I think they operate as if it never happened. That would be the type of person I was looking for. Ultimately, what all of us want at the end of the day is justice for Liz and her family. If anybody has any information regarding this case, please come forward. We are approaching the four-year mark. Liz deserves justice and her family deserves peace. Until next time, guys, thank you for listening and stay safe.